Hello everybody and welcome to today's podcast. Uh, this is episode number two of the current season 11 of Taking Care of Business. Uh, today I've got with me a guy who I've got, this is going to be a very, very interesting podcast, <laughs> I can tell you now. Um, Roger Martin Fagg is an economist, um, but some people think because I'm an accountant, I understand, people think this, you know, they think, oh, you understand accountancy, you understand economy, you understand global global world, the, the world global system, you understand every single part about what how finance should work. And that's not true, but what I do think about myself is that I've got, I've always had an opinion that's based on behaviours and gut feel, that when I first listened to you, maybe maybe when I first was in contact with you, it was about three years ago, mm. and a lot of what you said, one I agreed with, and quite a bit of what you said, I thought, well, that makes complete sense, and that was always my gut feel, and you kind of um, cemented lots of what I said, which I felt was general knowledge, to some people are made sense, whereas others would, other people would find it, I don't know what the word is, they, 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 they would find the old economist structure complicated. I find the structure very complicated, but the outcomes, common sense, and what you do is you've got knowledge of both, <laughs> which I haven't. So hopefully we're going to explain to people today where you think we're going. Because when you look at the media and you see the headlines, they're pretty scary, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and if you have no idea of what's going on, they're petrifying as we sit today. They're not even scary. Yeah. They're terrifying. So we're going to talk about where you think, what you think it means for people, because that's what I think the economist's job is to do, is to tell people what it means to them. And you're fantastic at doing that, if you don't mind me saying so. So before we go into where you think things like property prices are going to go and interest rates and unemployment levels and um, pay increase in private and public sectors, let's talk about your early days and um, and I guess why you're qualified to tell us. So what was early life like for you? Early life for me was very traditional. I went to one of those posh direct grant grammar schools uh, at the end of my first year, uh, the report card said, this boy is only not bottom because of a new boy who arrived recently. <laughs> I was not easy at school because what drove me was why. I wanted to know how things worked. Didn't matter what it was, I kept asking why. And a lot of the teachers I had wouldn't answer why. Anyway, uh, at this school, I was told I wasn't university material. I should have gone to the city and uh, made a lot of money. And that was a red rag to a bull. So I went to university, a university not approved by the school, who only sent boys to Russell Group University. I went to Leicester University and did a degree in economic development because by then, why are some countries richer than others? I wanted to know. Yeah. And this course was brilliant. We did economic history, we did geography, and we did economics. And after I graduated, I thought, okay, now I want to go and look at a different country. And I went overland to New Zealand. And I got a job in the New Zealand Treasury. And I was assigned to the energy division, the mines department. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for a couple of years, literally looking at the energy balance in New Zealand, but in particular, looking at how the interface between politics, economics, and people worked. To give you a very simple example, uh, under a conservative administration, I was required to write a report showing the impact of pit closures on local communities. Mm -hmm. And I, my report said, look, uh, you know, the fact that one miner's job goes and you lose three other jobs, that's not acceptable to the minister. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, well, that's what the data tells us. And I was told, but that's not acceptable to the minister. Yeah. And so therefore I discovered 
that a civil servant's duty is to obey the minister. Okay. And I, the number changed. And then we had a Labour government, mm -hmm. and the view was the same issue. And, of course, we went back to, for every miner's job, three other jobs went. Yeah. And I just then realised that the whole business of government is nothing to do with rational behaviour. Mm -hmm. It's all to do with ideology and emotion. And I came back from New Zealand and I worked on a farm for a bit. And then I thought, I've got to get a proper job. Mm -hmm. And I, in those days, it was tra the, the travel industry was booming. The jumbo, jumbo jets were in, yeah. uh, package holidays. Were, and I joined uh, in uh, the travel industry and air transport industrial training board as an economist. Okay. And my claim to fame is I am responsible for the change in the height width of air stewardesses. Right. Yes. Go on. How did that come Well, about? I told British Airways that uh, if you look at the demographics, the, the very tight constraints you have, uh, requirement for a stewardess, there just aren't enough females in the age band that mm -hmm. fits. Yep. So they changed it. I'm right. very proud of that. Very good. Um, and then I... Uh, in those days, I had a few mates, one who worked at the local tech college, and he bought me a beer one night and said, look, the guy who teaches economics has just done a runner with the principal secretary, and we've got no one to teach three groups of people. Their exams are in six weeks. And I said, why are you telling me? He said, well, you're an economist. I said, I'm not a teacher. And he said, it's five pounds an hour. And I needed a new gearbox for my little MG sports car. So I said, I'm in. Okay. So I wasn't trained in teaching. I went in. How old in. was you at this point, by the way? Hmm? How old was you? I was 25. Right. And then uh, they got the best exam results in economics they've ever had. And they said, do you want the, the post? So I got into teaching with just a first degree in economics, no doctorate, no teaching qualification. And I was at Slough Tech for 12 years, teaching postgrads. Yeah. And then I was headhunted to join Henley Business School, okay. where I spent 22 years. And I'm a behavioral economist because I know mainstream economics, because of the assumption it makes about us as human beings, yeah. is wrong. Yeah. That yeah. assumption is rational behavior. I do not know a rational human being. Fair enough. So that's what, how that's how we are where we are. Yeah. Let's look at where we are from a sort of where, where we are today and what the last five or six years, we were chatting before and I said, as a business owner, um, I, I don't know whether we've had so many, um, so many ups and downs of a Brexit, five, prime ministers over that period of time. I don't think we've still, you know, we're still in the middle of Brexit, even though I think we voted on it, is it six years ago now? Yeah, 2016. Uh, we've had COVID. We're just about to come out of COVID. We get a war. So let's just, and then now we're just starting to talk about, as a result of the war and other things that we might go into, energy prices, mm -hmm. inflation, and there's this whole doom and gloom about the media. So if we just backtrack to five years ago when there was a Brexit or a Remain vote, which side of the fence was you on and why? Okay. I. It's interesting because I think there's heart and head. In my heart, I, being a Brit, we're mm. bloody-minded, mm. aren't we, as a nation? And the idea that someone within Europe might tell me how to bring up my kids, I would not approve of. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people have that sense. Sure. Uh, and then I realized that actually uh, the EU wasn't about that. I was being convinced of it by the media. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a lot of research and I realized that a lot of what the British government said uh, we had to do because of the EU was not the case. Mm -hmm. It was difficult stuff that government wanted to blame others for. So I most certainly voted Remain. Mm -hmm. And 
The reason I voted Remain is because Europe is our nearest and biggest market. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what happened when we joined, it gave access to 300 million consumers for small companies yeah. without the expense of customs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And people who voted leave don't accept this, but it was a huge benefit. Yeah. And it was Mrs. Thatcher who wanted to create the single market. Yeah. That was your biggest reason. That's <clears throat> my biggest reason. There's other reasons, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, there's, other, there's certainly other things that are, that are in the melting pot of today's um, storm. That's that's on the horizon that we'll talk about in a bit. And one of them I've always, one of the reasons I have been a staunch Remainer was the freedom of movement. Yep. That was probably my overriding yep. thing. Actually, I had two issues. One was a freedom of movement. I knew there'd be restrictions of freedom of trade, of course, that, that, that evolves. And the other that actually came more to fruition than other, which was just gut feeling was, when you've, and I, I think like this, and this is very layman's terms, but I think when you've got the local idiot, if he's in the village, you've all got to be careful of the local idiot, right? The local idiot never goes into a big city centre and behaves like an idiot because he doesn't know how big or how powerful the other potential idiots he might be in the company of. So I always think if you're going to Manchester for a night out, you've got less, or London, you've got less chance of seeing trouble as if you're in a local village. <laughs> because what actually happens is, in, in a localised scenario, you can put power into the wrong people. Mm. And I thought Boris Johnson was that village idiot. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that Brexit paved the way for him. And actually, the way he's behaved would be like, if you ask me, like a bully. Yep. That would that would behave like that village idiot in a localised area without the overarching guidance of a greater power. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that was the main thing that scared me before I knew the outcome of what Boris would do. But the other thing, two things, was one, as you just said, the freedom of trade, but the freedom of movement scared me. Mm. And I thought it was a backward step. I thought it was a backward step for me as a layman. I want to be able to go and spend 120 days in Spain, if I want to spend 120 sure. days in Spain. Sure. Why should we go back from that principle? Sure. But more so than that, and I think it's part of the melting pot of where we are today, it would stop people coming into our country to do the jobs that we needed to do. Mm -hmm. So where we sit today, was that part of your reason? Did you think it would be part of the issue that we had today, the lack of sure. people to do the work? Do you know, it's, it's, sense. it's very interesting, people to do the work, but for me it's much, much more than that. Wars begin because of misunderstandings. And my view is the more people talk and understand each other's cultures, there are a lot less chance they're going to beat each other up. So I think the freedom of movement of people was <coughs> partly economic, but predominantly social. Yeah. For me, freedom of movement guarantees peace because the, 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 the typical view of the foreigner, the German, the French, mm. whatever, yeah, is wrong. Mm. You know, we're all human beings. Mm. And I'm dismayed that we are becoming more insular, more arrogant, and actually our performance relative to our neighbours is falling. Yeah. We have Brexit and yeah. then we move fast forward. Now, it's not uncommon to have, uh, we were probably due at any point now anyway, regardless of all these external factors that are very unique to any five or six year period. We were probably due, our last recession was 2008. Yep. Yeah. So any time now we were due that next level of um, the next part of the curve, which was something like a recession. So before we get into where we are today, the landscape when you go back, I always remember um, being at a property forum in in London, and they just drew on the the, the opening um, the opening the opening graph was a graph that had 
since 1944, the house prices. Mm -hmm. And actually, every 10 years or every 12 years or whatever it is, you'll know this better than me, there's always an up, down a level enough, an up, down a level enough. And it was actually really quite, what's the word, cyclical. Yeah. So we were due some kind of recession anyway. Just, have you got, so the last one was 2008. If we would have been in normal times now, forget all those external events, what would we, what would, should, should we have been expecting by now? Should we have been expecting to be in that kind of scenario or not? It's a very good point you make. And <clears throat> if you actually look at your cycle, then we were actually slowing in 2018 and 2019. We didn't have a recession, but if you actually look at it, the growth rate slowed. And I was beginning to think, well, that's our turn on the cycle. And I expected you know, 2019, uh, 2020, uh, without COVID, to be a, a reasonable but not hugely boomy year. In other words, we came to the top of the curve and we were flattening and we were going to slow a little, but not much. Mm -hmm. um, and then you factor in the lack of free movement, the lack of labor supply. And even pre-COVID, it was clear that our growth rate was going to be limited by people. Yeah. And it was again pre-COVID, People like me were saying, do you know what? Over the next few years, we are not going to manage yeah. inflation-free growth of more than about 1.7%. Yeah. And for people listening who might not actually understand what a recession means what or the measurement of a recession, can you just fill us in on that if you don't mind? Yeah, the official definition is two successive quarters of negative growth. Mm -hmm. It's a funny word, negative growth, yeah, yeah. but it means GDP inflation adjusted has fallen for two successive quarters. Okay. And interesting enough, if you've got Q1 of the year negative, Q2 positive, Q3 negative, that's not an official recession. Sure. sure. And when we talk about GDP, again, just for people listening, yeah. what we're we measuring. Right. Well, you start yeah. with nominal GDP which is either, you can look at it as the value of total sales mm -hmm. adjusted for VAT, or you can look at it as the value of total incomes and profits. If you adjust for overseas trade, those two values should be the same. Yep. Okay. So we're looking at income generation, basically. Yep. Yeah. And <clears throat> nominal. And then we adjust for the change in the value of money, mm -hmm. i.e. inflation, to get real growth. Sure. So take right now, uh, our nominal growth is around 12%. Spending is growing at about 12. Okay. But you adjust it for inflation and you come out at around two and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um, and sorry, to go into recession, we're talking about having two negative or uh, retraction yeah. in the economy. Yeah. Okay. And just while we're there, if, for example, over the next... Uh, Two quarters, mm -hmm. uh, nominal GDP, i.e. spending, is still growing at 10%, yep. but inflation is 12, mm -hmm. then we officially will have a recession. Sure. Even though spending is growing at 10%. Yeah. yeah. And what would we aim for? What would be a normal year? A normal year would be inflation running at two, yeah. real growth running at around two, yeah. pops. Yeah. So uh, nominal GDP growing between 4 and 5%. Okay. COVID comes. Yep. Um, and COVID comes, and it's a worldwide problem. Yep. It's a financial worldwide problem, isn't it? Because we, we probably have no option. You might agree or disagree with this. We probably have no option but to print new money. Yep and lend it to people in some cases or give it or to give people it, yeah. in other cases um, across, the, across the world to, for yeah. us to get through, right? So in England, in the UK, over the period of COVID, we, we crystallised, invented, produced, I don't know which is the best word, um, manufactured. Produced, manufactured, how much of money? 450 billion. 450 billion and that was given out on those support schemes yep 
And across the world it was? Well, across the world it was 17 trillion. Okay. So from a global perspective, within, it might have been nine months or whatever it was, within that period, there was 17 trillion pounds worth of extra money that didn't exist before we went in. Yeah, an 18 month period. 18 months in total. Yeah. Right. So the full length of the COVID period, yeah. really. Right. So we've got 17 trillion as a globe and and 450 of that is produced in our yep. uh, in our country. So in the early days of COVID, you can't spend it. So it's pretty clear that people are now sat on excess cash. Correct. They can't spend it. Sure, online's gone through the roof, but it, it's not going to be replaced by a mixture of our day-to-day -day stuff, including online. So you you will know these figures better than me, but there was a significant growth in the holding on to monies from either corporates or individuals. Yep. And do we know how much that was roughly or? Yes. Um, what uh, Typically, a typical family yep. was sitting on 180 billion of cash, more than normal. In the UK. In the UK. Yeah. Okay. And the, the, the banks constantly put money into the economy, but it's not usually like 450 billion. No. It's... no uh, the, normally, the banking system yeah. puts in around 80 to 90 billion a year. Right. And at this point, they're putting in four, 400. Yeah. Much, much more than that. And we can't spend it. So no. the bubble's growing. Yep. The water balloon's filling. Yeah. And then we come out of first lockdown. Yeah. And we start spending. Of course, everybody wants to spend. And so we let the water out, but it can only go out a certain force, of course, in a few months. And we're back into lockdown. Yeah. And we're continuing to add to whatever the first batch of monies was. In total, over 18 months, it's 450 billion. Correct. But it, I don't know what the first, it was 150 in the first, I don't know what it was. I think you can roughly say it was 50-50, so it was 200 billion first time. Now, a layman, as a, or, and, 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 or an economist like you, I guess, somebody like me would say, well, at some point then, people will start buying more because mm -hmm. they've got more money. Mm -hmm. And if you buy more, in simple terms... Unless you increase the amount of quantities of stuff, supply and demand. Yeah. You, if you do, and actually, what's happened? We'll come to it. I think in a bit. In worse is is a double bubble, in if you like, because there's been a retracting in some cases of the supply. Correct. It was affected in China, and we buy a lot from China, for example. But it made complete logical sense, and at some point down the line, when we got to relative normality. Um, we would start spending the money we had. Yep. And um, and that would push up the prices and everything, which pushes up inflation. Correct. But actually, if we look at it, to be fair to the government, there probably wasn't at that point another alternative, was there? No. I think, I mean, COVID support had to happen. And if it hadn't have happened with lockdowns, then the capacity of business to produce post-COVID would disappear mm. because companies would have failed. Shops yeah. would have shut, yeah. factories would have shut. Yeah. No, it, you know, it, it was the right thing to do at the time, but it was always going to be inflationary when COVID ended. Sure. Always. Yeah. No question. Yeah. So COVID... I'm not sure whether it's come or gone. I'm not actually quite sure no. where COVID... It's off the news, that's for sure. Uh, but COVID has come or, or, and gone. And now we're on, the, we're on the other side of it. So without a war, which I think adds to the mm -hmm. mix, we do have the issue of... Because I've got um, retailers who are, who, you know, are, 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 are getting their supply chain origination from China. Mm-hmm. And um, and the cost of getting the goods over is significantly higher yep. than before. And that's become a worldwide problem. Is that a COVID problem? I mean, China keep going into mini lockdowns, I believe. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. but Yes. So I think there's a worldwide distribution problem that stems out of there, which is creating even more problems. Yeah, I think the worldwide <laughs> distribution problem has eased 
and the best indicator is the price of a container out yep. of China, which was a twenty dollars, twenty thousand dollars. It's now I think around six, seven. Really? So it's coming back. Started down. at two, three, I think, from yeah pre COVID. No, it started with two, two and a yeah. half. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the supply from China you know, it sort of goes up and down. Yeah. But supply chains have eased a bit. But the fact remains is the monetary demand is still well above the, the whole world's ability to supply. And that is why inflation is running at 8% in the world. Yeah. In the world. Yeah. Yeah. 10% here. 10% here. Is there any reason why we're slightly up than the rest of the world? Yes. We're higher because of the weakness of uh, sterling against the dollar. Every, uh, that 2% is basically sterling dollar weakness. Right. By the way, it's not wages. It's not unions, as a lot of people say. It's the exchange rate. Fine. When you look at that 400 and odd billion, and we're chatting about this earlier because you've done a presentation here today, um, one of the things I originally thought, which you put me straight on today, um, was I originally thought, well, hold on, you put 450 billion out as a government, um, but you get that back in VAT and taxes and all the rest of it. So actually, you're going to get most of that back pretty quickly. But that's actually not the case, is it, of course, because the government is probably the biggest spender in the UK, yeah. I guess. Um, so how what happens? Just talk us through what happens to that money. It gets pushed out. It gets spent. Typically, how long does it get spent over? Hmm. And then in reality, does it just keep regurgitating and recycling forever, I guess? Great question. And basically, it keeps flowing around the system. Yeah. You know, tax receipts go into government. They flow out of government, you know, on on uh, an app that doesn't work, test and trace. Yeah. It flows out of government in national health, in social support, in pensions, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So the government is just part of a circuit sure. in, out. Uh, the important thing is that this 17 trillion created uh, partly is being reduced because the Federal Reserve is selling back the bonds that they bought. Yeah. And they've taken already about 4 trillion out Really? which is why there's a liquidity crisis for dollars. Okay. But we haven't taken anything out, nor has the European Central Bank. Right. Right. Now, the purchasing power of that money is falling by about 10%. Sure. Because of inflation. Yeah. And, of course, that's what inflation does. It actually reduces the purchasing power of money to match the availability of goods and services. Sure. And when that equalizes, yeah. inflation drops to 2% and we're back to normal. Yeah. It's happening more quickly than we would have liked, thanks to Putin and energy prices putting another 4% into the mix. Yeah. Yeah. So without the without that war, we would still be in. Oh, yeah. This, this we'd still be in, would we be in a cost of living crisis? We would, wouldn't we? Or we'd be certainly in an inflationary We'll be in an inflationary period where it's going to be very difficult for wages, particularly in the public sector, to keep pace with prices. Yes. It's quite interesting, that point, because we act in a lot of industries and um, it's been it's been the Wild West. There's no mm. other way of describing mm. since what I would class as the get out of COVID middle of last year. Yeah. Um, I've had clients where they've had a somebody on 38 grand a year get offered a job at 75 grand yeah. a year. Similar job. It's been the Wild West. And I always thought one of the issues that I would say, and I'm not sure you could police this in fairness to the government. I'm not a fan of this government. We'll probably move on to at some point. But it's very difficult to get that amount of money out that quickly and be a great police officer of where it's going. And a lot of that money went to people that were doing well. Yeah. Not people who weren't. Yeah. I can tell you that for a fact. We have a banking team here. And if you were a travel agency and you were closed, you weren't getting a C-bills loan. No. Right? If you were doing well and you didn't really need one. You get it. You get it. Yep. So what was happening was people were taking it and storing up money. Yeah. In fairness, though, to give the economy a real injection when we came out of it. Yeah. Right? So 
all of a sudden recruitment fees that nobody likes paying, nobody cares about anymore. No. Right? So we've got recruitment clients here and they have a record month every month. Because all of a sudden then your PL, it doesn't really matter as much when you sat on such cash reserves. And that's what's actually happened. That I, I think that's what's really inflated movement in uh, movement or transition of people within jobs and, and staff turnover in all the businesses we work for are much higher than on a generic level. And again, it's not aided by the fact we haven't got overseas workers coming sure. in and challenging for them roles. It's a bit of a perfect storm that we're in at the moment. Yeah, and of course, it has increased inequality in this country massively. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, you know, those high flyers, IT people, yeah. have got 30% increases, yeah. but the care worker hasn't. Yeah. And for me, the cost of COVID is a, a significant increase in equality of wealth. Yeah. House owners have done very nicely, renters have not. Yeah. And skilled people in the workforce, gen generic, have done really well, yeah. unskilled, basically not. Yeah. So as a result of COVID, Britain is more unequal by a long way yeah. than it was in 2019. It's a great point that because, yeah, because some I asked you the question before um, in, in, in the talk that you did, I know that there's some people getting 100% pay rises yeah. to move. But in reality, 25% of the workforce are in our public sector. Correct. And they're not getting... They're Anything like two, inflation three, arises. No. Yeah. So if we move on again, then, we was always going to be in a sticky situation and then the, um, the, the war happens. It's like one thing after another here. How's that impacted where we are at the moment? Energy. I think, I mean, it, we can talk about global or we can talk about the UK. The thing about the UK is that since actually 2012, there has been a government view that uh, with free markets, with uh, free trade, you don't really have to have security of energy supply domestically. You can get it from anywhere. Sure. Everyone wants to sell it. So we made a huge mistake by effectively closing gas reserve reservoirs. Uh, we used to have, I think, up to six months gas supply uh, stored in the Cheshire yeah, yeah. salt mines yeah. and uh, three other places. And government chose not to fund that, I think, in 2017. And so it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So we, I think, have got four days supply. Really? The assumption being that we could always get it through the interconnector yeah. from Europe. Yeah. Well... What Putin has done is showed Germany and Europe's huge dependence on Russia, mm -hmm. and it's exposed our dependence on Europe. Yeah. yeah. So to cut a long story short, the risk to us right now is blackouts. Yeah. If it's a very cold winter, the government says we're fine. I just don't believe it. How does that work? When was the last time we had blackouts? As an well, I think the last time, seriously, was 72-3, three, the three-day yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, productivity, and a lot of what you talk about in the economy is productivity, isn't it? I think it yeah. underpins everything, really. Yeah. I mean, that's a disaster, is it? It sounds like it's a disaster. Well, yeah, the, interesting, as a behavioralist, the great thing about the three-day week is it sort of energize the world there's a war effort yeah and so in three days we produce nearly sure. the same as five yeah, yeah yeah and so you know if it happens here if we have it uh, industry shuts down households will still get power yeah and we may, you know there might be that great sense of well we'll we'll beat this yeah and it's okay yeah but my view is there is still complacency in government and I suspect complacency in households my view is we can reduce energy demand by 20% putting a jumper on turning the thermostat down yeah. Yeah, all the yeah. Yeah. and government will not advise people because people should be free to make their own choices sure. but there are lots of people who have only understood energy surpluses young people leave lights on 
Yeah. 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 Older people switch off. Yeah. So I think there could be a day of reckoning happening in the next six months if it's a really cold winter. Yeah. It's a little bit of a reset. Yeah. Which in the end is what a recession is made for. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's it made is. for a reset. You yeah. Come on to it a little in a little second. So so that brings us even closer. So we know we're going to have a problem. I think there's a problem for Brexit, and we're never going to know now what what the outcome of Brexit was going to be because it's been further hampered, muddied by COVID. We won't know the answer. Now we've got a war. Over that period of time, what you really need is good leadership. Yeah. And I just defy anybody to, to tell me anything other than we've had horrendous leadership We've had the worst leadership at the worst possible time. And whether or not you forget all the the COVID, the U-turns, well, we've had more U-turns lately, but the backtracks, the money wasted on test and trace, mates getting backhanders, do as I say not. For me, from a leadership perspective, it couldn't get any worse. By the way, when Theresa May was in, I thought the same. Couldn't get any worse. Hmm. Then we had Boris, and I and thought, it did. well, to be honest, at least it doesn't get any worse. And now we've had Liz Truss in for, when this goes out, what will be six or seven weeks. And we're one week, not even one week from her, doing her first real project, and it's a complete mess. Hmm. I don't think she's, you'll know more than this than me, and we've you turned on it now, um, and she's thrown a uh, chancellor under the bus and he's gone within three or four weeks. But the Bank of England, an economist, must have had an idea what she was about to do, what what the, the current government was about to do, was going to have a repercussion. Mm. Have they just not done any due diligence? Have they just gone off with something on a right-wing motive to get pats on the back from the mates? What do you think? What I think is very simple. Uh, Tom Schooler, who was permanent secretary of the Treasury, been in the job, I think, 14 years, so was there in the big crash. Yep. And who clearly has been around the houses many times. I am sure when Kwasi Kwarteng said, look, this is my list of to do, this is what I want in the mini budget, I am sure Tom Schooler would have said, the implication of that choice is this, that, in other words, he would have said what happened would have happened. He was fired that day. So here is a new leader yeah. firing someone because they don't like the truth. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be careful and not be emotive here. That is utterly disgraceful. And it shows an arrogance and a total inability to lead. I was about to finish that sentence with the same two words. It's a complete lack of leadership, isn't it? It is. And I looked at it when the first budget came out and somebody rang me, a client rang me and went, we've got rid of the 25%, we're back down to 19. That's a co obviously the corporation tax rate. And I was a bit speechless to a degree because I thought one there is an element of politics in this and people are scared mm. so if you lead 70 million people and, a, and the bottom 20 or 30 percent are very very worried you know they don't have savings and they're looking and they're reading the media and they're also they're getting the bills and yeah. not just reading the media they're getting the bills there's a real panic here about what's going to happen and then one of the policies is to reduce from 45% to 40% people earning over 150 grand a year, <laughs> which I said at the time to the guy, we've got 2,000 clients here, nobody really bothers about. Nobody ever really. They might have a, a little whinge, a little moan. They might, it might be a quip. There's never any more than a quip. So we've just reduced the tax collection rate for the people who are going to be all right anyway, the top third, how can how can you possibly get that so wrong? Or is that just a purely political question and got nothing to do with economics? I think it's purely political. I, I, let's remind ourselves that Truss was elected by 80,000 people. 
not the nation. Yeah. Members of the Tory party, uh, from my observation, many of them comfortably retired, i.e. not in the business of business. Mm -hmm. And it's an ideology based on a complete misunderstanding how, of how economies work. Yeah. And the thing that is in my mind, uh, this was an actual statement by a banker who said, oh, it's a pity that they've reneged on that 45%. I was looking forward to that 75 grand. I was going to my, buy myself another Porsche. And when you hear that, you realize how crass the decision was. Yeah. They, I think the budget could have been really easy and simple. I think the idea of that, nobody was expecting it, so why do it? doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No. I think you need to put a bit of money right now in people's pockets. So the NI reduction and the basic rate tax reduction for, by 1%, which has now been U-turned, was the right thing to do. That's what I think. And, and I said this to you before. As an owner of a business, when you, somebody says to you you're going from 19 to 25%, it's, a bit, it's quite a bitter pill to swallow, I personally believe, because one, you've just come out of COVID. It's, mm. been, a, it's been a battle. Um, two, people think you've got a 6% rise in your, in your cost there. You haven't. From 19 to 25% is roughly a 27.5% mm. increase in your tax bill. Yeah. That's a lot. So I personally wouldn't have gone as high as 25, but I would have gone somewhere in the middle of 22. Mm -hmm. And I think what would have happened then is my 19 to 22 gets us more tax receipts on one hand. And on the other hand, going from 25 net potential to 22 gets me a pat on the back from the business community that are now expecting 25%. So to me, that is a win-win to hold on to tax receipts. Can I interrupt you? Go. But that's because you've got emotional intelligence. How and can we... that is what Truss and Kwarteng have, in my <laughs> observation, zero of. It is zero because the next thing that they should have done, that's even more obvious than that, is a windfall tax. I know. Which nobody would have complained about. No. Nope. The voter would have cheered... And the, the, the corporations have actually come out and said they weren't even that bothered by. Correct. I want you to just go into that a little bit because you said something earlier when we were talking about, about business plans and how recessions come to fruition because of business plans. Yeah. And actually, that there was, a, as a result of that methodology, if you like, there was actually the ability to take a top slice that's yeah. not expected. If you don't mind, just yeah. talk to me a bit I about mean, that. A major oil company like BP Shell work on a, a long-term scenario of 20 years mm -hmm. and a rolling business plan of five years. And that business plan will have assumptions about oil prices and therefore gas prices. They'll have assumptions about the reserves they own. And uh, they will also have a requirement to make X return for shareholders. And they build this all into their business plan. And as part of that is their planned investment. In the oil industry, investment is long term, as you sure. know. And uh, as a result of the completely unexpected change in energy prices, there is a top line growth that's way out of plan. And there are profits coming in quarterly around 8 billion this is for shell yeah uh, 8 billion above plan yeah. so therefore you can tax that 8 billion away without affecting anything it doesn't affect investment it doesn't affect the dividend and they've told us that the yeah. chairman of bp said you can tax it away it won't change our plan yeah so not to do that is pure ideology and that ideology, you can't not mix a talk on e economy and the economy without bringing in politics. But sure. that ideology is the farthest. It's the opposite of where a Corbyn would be on the far left. Yes. It's, the, it's the furthest right you could possibly go. Yeah. It's the epitome of the furthest right you could possibly go. Yeah. And makes actually no sense. Correct. Okay. So we are where we are today. <laughs> So I think this morning they talked about inflation at 10%. I 
I, have, I haven't got a clue where we're going with energy prices because I've so, already told you earlier. We've got some businesses in the manufacturing game where they pay £15,000 per month for their fuel bills in June, and that's going up to eighty five. Yeah. And there's nothing they can do about that. No. Except close. Yep. So where do you think we are today is the question. And in the in the short, in, well, where do you think we are today and where do you think we are over the next 18 months or two years? How bad do you think that's going to be? And then I will drill a little bit further into uh, house prices. and But a generalist to start with, I said this again earlier because we've been together all day. I said, I look we have look after a lot of retailers and I could see August tailed off, September tailed off further. Not drastically though. It feels like if you was watching a movie and one and, and, and you see the tornado in the distance, you know it's coming and you're just starting to feel Building. the bluster of the wind. Yeah. You know, you can feel it now. And it feels like people are still going, I've still got money. I don't know if I will have, so I'm just, mm. I'm in that scenario. That seems to be, for me, where we are. Generally, where do you think we are? Then we're going to move into inflation, interest rates, property, sure. what it means to people. I think where we are is that we still have the benefit of the excess money created last year. So if you look at the consumer, they're spending 12% more than a year ago in actual cash terms. But, of course, they're not getting 12% more stuff. Mm. And uh, that, that you know, we talked about that $180 billion or thereabouts. Yeah. That is being eroded extremely quickly. Yeah. And I expect 40% of households by February next year to be in what I call monetary disequilibrium. In other words, their end-of-the-month bank balance is shrinking. That is the point at which they really change their spending pattern. Yeah. And one of the, for me, the bellwethers is you'll see Waitrose sales falling and you'll see little sales rising. It's already starting. Yeah. Now, how serious that is depends primarily on those energy bills. Because inflation's a year-on-year -year measure, there is no doubt inflation will be moderating. So by this time next year, I would expect inflation to be around 6%. Mm -hmm. But the amount of money going into our system now is only enough to finance an inflation rate of 5% with zero growth or minus 1% growth with inflation at 6%. Mm -hmm. So whichever way you look at it, next year is going to be very slow or yeah. negative. Yeah. Which means a recession. It does. That's what you said before. And, and, and if you was... Well, when you're a top-down economist, you look at it, the, the top third of the country are going to be fine, I guess. Yep. They always are. Yeah, they are. The middle third is a, quite a tricky one um, because, sadly, the bottom third is not that tricky at all, is it? They're in, deep, they're in trouble. They are. Um, the middle third somewhere, obviously, in the middle, right? Where, yeah. But the thing is, is, as you said before, if somebody has a £100 a month budget to go for meals, they've still got a £100 budget for meals. It's just if, if the meal's gone from 33 quid... To 50. to 50 quid, they go for two instead of three. Correct. The spend is still relatively the same. But the activity is less. Yes. Yeah, you've yeah. got it. So what you end up with is is the higher, before, the, the, the higher the brand or the higher the restaurant or the higher the society, relatively unscathed. Yes. What does the lower end do? Uh, a statistic that I resonates with me, there are 3,000 branches of McDonald's in the UK and there are 5,000 food banks. This is in the sixth yeah. richest country yeah. on earth. Uh, there's no words. 
So there is going to be more and more demand of food banks. Yeah. There are going to be some extreme cases of yeah. serious poverty. Yeah. And I think I think it's possible that with Hunt as uh, um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, it is possible there'll be more discretionary allowances to local authorities okay. to help people in real yeah. distress. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be a lot of money in the scheme of Not things, but the tracing. impact yeah. on people's and society's cohesion sure. would be significant. But being political, what we've currently got is a very far right wing leader. We do, and it, <laughs> let's be really political. Yeah. If there was a general election tomorrow, there would be a Labour government. Yeah, and we probably need it. And I'm going to be political there, I don't mind saying it. I've voted Labour in the past and I've voted Tory. I'm somewhere in the middle, and I've said this before. Every if we had a if we had a, if if I have an argument with my missus and she tells you your story and I tell you my story, somewhere in the middle will be the truth. Yes. And I've always said at some stage, I can be slightly far left on a topic. If you were talking to me about should kids get hot meals, I'd be more on the left hand side at a at a dial than I would be on the right hand side. Yeah. Uh, there might be things by the way with taxes. I'm entrepreneurial, so I'll be slightly more on the right-hand side. Sure. I wish more people, I'll be honest, was a little bit more liberal like that than just mm. going, my mum voted Tory all alive, so I must, or my yeah. mum voted Labour. By the way, that got ripped up in the last <laughs> election pretty much anyway, didn't it, to a yeah. degree? So hopefully we'll see some the, the, the same swing backwards. But um, what you actually need, I think, is a Labour government. Which is a very interesting point. If you actually look at all the evidence... A proper lunchtime meal improves the performance of kids. And it's not a big spend. And I'm one of those people who says every state school should have a hot lunch provided. And in depressed areas, I would say breakfast. Yeah. Uh, and as an economist, the benefits to a child's development and education are so much bigger than the actual cost. Yeah. Anyway, um, <coughs> my politics are very simply, I think I'm called, I would call myself a, a wet Tory because I believe in entrepreneurs. I yeah. believe in work. Yeah. But I would vote. If there's an election tomorrow, I'd vote Labour. Snap. For one very simple reason. All I want is a cohesive bunch of people who agree doing some boring things consistently well is what this country needs. Agreed. Stability. Stability. If we... Um, you took me my... I was going to say something <laughs> then about the... Uh, I was going to say something then about the Labour government, and it's just slipped my mind, but I'm sure it'll come back to me in a second. In terms of, um, it's going to be very difficult at that at that lower level. That's what I was going to say. We talked quite a bit about a reset, and actually that's what a recession is, so people can get really scared. I think mm. the media really create a frenzy about mm. the, the word we're in a recession. And in many ways, there's a reset. We'll just touch on that in a second, but I, I think the same on politics. I think what's happened is there becomes an arrogance by so many consecutive wins. Yes. That that actually the party might start, for example, f relatively right to get the not sitting on the fence where you get the votes. But then during the, the term, the early term, they actually go towards the middle. Yeah. But the more consecutive ones you win, you think, and you look at this Tory government, we can fucking get away with anything. Yep. And they do. Yeah. They have. And at that point, there becomes an arrogance that needs a reset. And that's as good a reason for me any right now is to realign that actually they can't ride rough trot over whatever they do and just get away with it without it being a repercussion means we might only have a Labour government for one term or two terms, but it pulls it back again and we create some reset stability. So it's a good point you're making. You see, I actually think the, the markets 
two weeks ago drove the reset. Yeah, she is not in power. Hunt is in yes. power. Yeah. And Hunt has already announced a very sensible middle of the road budget. Yeah. Uh, and we know that the parliamentary Conservative Party did not want trust. They wanted Sunak, who I would have supported. And so you've got a position where the 80,000 have screwed it. Yeah. And do you know what? Good. Yes, I agree. So where do we think? We're going to some more specifics now as we, we are actually coming towards the end, but there's still plenty to go through. What do you think about, let's talk interest rates first. Yeah. We're at three, what's the, what's the base rate today? Uh, 2.25 at right. the moment. And we're in a position where when I grew up, it was four point odd or four. Yeah. That's kind of what I thought a base rate yeah. tended to be. We've actually had a good run really of almost zero base yeah. rates, but that probably couldn't continue forever. <laughs> so in reality, going back to a reset, we're getting back to what was a general normal uh, interest rate. Where do you see them going? Maxing out and then... Okay, that. first of all, since 2012, money's been free. And that's not healthy. Yes. And that's why things have turned out, why we've had a property boom, et cetera, et cetera. The correct rate of interest is the country's real growth rate plus 2.5%. Mm -hmm. So let's assume our growth rate at best is 2, mm -hmm. then 45 is base rate as it should be. Yes. That would that's normal. Yep. If you've got an inflationary bubble, you've got to be above four and a half. Mm -hmm. And because we're used to sub one and a half percent for so long, even the Bank of England is reluctant to mm. move to the mm. correct rate mm. quickly because, of course, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Sure. But we will end up. If we meet a year from now, I'd put a lot of money on 4.5% base rate. Yeah. Which means mortgages are going to be? Well, if it's a floating rate mortgage, mortgage is going to be about 55 Yeah. But if it's a fixed rate mortgage, yeah. we've got a different arithmetic. Yeah. Yeah. And the fixed rate mortgage is related to the yield on government bonds, yeah. long-dated bonds. Yeah. That yield is running around 43 if the Bank of England, and I think it probably won't, decides to undo some of the quantitative easing, yeah. that rate's going to go to 5.5, okay. which means the fixed mortgage rate is going to be 7, really? 7.5. Yeah. So I think it's clear, as I say this yeah. to you, the Bank of England will delay yeah. the unwinding of the quantitative easing. Okay. House prices. Yes. House prices, they, yeah, two, we'll, we'll talk house prices and then we'll talk about what you think about jobs, the jobs market, yep. and then we'll end on exchange rate and just see where you think we are with those fluctuations. So, yeah, let's go back to house prices. People think there's going to be a crash. What do you think? I don't. I think house prices will stop rising. But I don't think there's going to be a crash. The reason is this. You get a house price crash when the banks stop providing mortgages, 2008, 1990. That's not what's going to happen this time. Banks want to lend. Given their cost base, they need to lend. They've yeah. got to get more sales. Yeah. And so they, you know, they will be lending. And... If you actually look at the multiples of income that the average house price is, contrary to popular belief, mm -hmm. it's not out of line. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we've got to distinguish between prices and transactions. Yes. We yeah. normally do 100,000 transactions a month. That could fall back a bit to around 90,000, and so a lot of estate agents will start complaining. Yeah, yeah. But when it comes to the price of a house, remember, 
what's happened in the last two years is someone has set a selling price and the house has sold well above it. Yep. The selling price will be a surveyor estate agent mm -hmm. assessment and it will be designed to achieve the sale. Yep. Yes, so you'll get a selling price of suggested at X and the actual purchase will probably sell at 5% below. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily a falling price. Yeah. It's a difference from the expectation sure. of a higher price. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah. You mentioned unemployment. <clears throat> Unemplo we're still going to be in full employment a year from now. Yeah. Even though you know, vacancies will fall away and the number of unemployed will, slip, will drift a little, but not much. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, Take the banks out of this. The other thing that drives willingness or ability to buy a house is the level of employment. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't got enough labor. We haven't got. Stands. We're three and a half million short of yeah. people. Yeah. Last question then. Um, exchange rates and markets. What do you think happens to those? Okay. Well, when you go to markets, if we look at the equity market, yeah. uh, global equity markets have been overvalued by about 30%. So there, if you look at the data, they're drifting down yep. to fair value. Yeah, yeah. And it's a very simple example. People say, "Oh my goodness, my share portfolio has gone down ten percent. This yeah. is a disaster." Yeah. I'd say, "Well, just take the trend of the last five years, and you're still well up on yeah. what you were five yeah. years ago." Yeah. So it's not a disaster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to uh, exchange rates. The one thing Interestingly that, on uh, that, so to yeah, interrupt on. you on there, and we'll finish yeah. on interest rates. We're at about, today, I don't I haven't looked today, but we'll be at about 7,000 as a FTSE That's 100. That's FTSE, yeah. Um, I was very lucky to go in the markets when they were five odd, yeah. COVID, they came back yeah. to seven and they maintained. Um, but when you actually go back five years, it was about seven. Yeah. There's been very, very little growth in our market since Brexit. Correct. When you look at the Dow Jones, for example, because that was another index fund that I went into, they were at 33, I think, from uh, pre-COVID, dropped to 19, yeah. went up to 37, and he's back down at 30. That's it. So, so you're right, but but if you look at the two difference, you've had and the the UK market has been pretty stagnant now. Yes. For well, almost since well, 2016. Yes, yeah, it's Brexit. It's Brexit. US has gone up, but you're now starting to see. It's table. beginning to adjust yeah. that. Yeah, you're right. Um, and then, so yeah, so I interrupted you there. But the last question then is on uh, exchange rates because um, I used to go to Spain, <laughs> right? Well, it's per is when I first went, but I used to be able to go and get nearly one and a half, I'd calculate it. Now, sometimes I go to Spain and it costs me £105 to get €100. Euros. Yeah. Where's well, that going? I think it's going to settle at around 115, 116. Uh, assuming we have stability in government, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, sterling should settle dollar about 112. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to be much better than that because I don't think people in this country realize the reputational crash that's happened yeah you know britain was always seen as stable yeah place to put your money safe the last three weeks have made us look like a banana republic yeah yeah, yeah. and i think what a lot of people don't understand friends on my facebook when i say yeah but look at the dollar and they go well, I'm not going to America anyway. It doesn't affect me. <laughs> they don't understand that probably 65% of the stuff we buy, wherever we buy it from, is priced in dollars. I don't Correct. know that amount. But uh, no, global trade, 60% is, is dollar. It? Yeah, nearly 60%. And uh, about a third of our spending is on imports. And at least half of that is priced in dollars. Yeah. All raw materials, uh, all energy. And... Uh, Every 10% drop in the dollar is 1% on our inflation rate. Yeah. Last comment with you then just to finish this podcast, and thank you for coming in. I really appreciated it. In general, despite the, bloom, the, the gloom that the media will portray on, a, on, a, on what is probably a, a definitive recession yeah. coming, um, what will be your overall view of, of it? Okay, I'm going to be contentious. 
And the way I explain it is from time to time, you need to clear out a food cupboard because you realize there's stuff in there that you've had for years that you don't use and isn't very good. So you ditch it. The recession is like clearing out the food cupboard. There are going to be businesses that fail. Many of them are close to what we call zombie businesses. They're only surviving because of COVID yep. support or whatever, or support before COVID. And they are commanding scarce resources that other businesses could use better. They should be allowed to go. The press will be full of insolvencies at record. Mm. They will be. And in some cases, good companies will go, but in most cases, there'll be companies that actually weren't particularly well run. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a huge believer in the potential of this country thanks to our SMEs. 65% of our income is driven by businesses that employ less than 200 people. Many, many, not all, but many of them are fleet of foot, they adapt, they innovate. The owners don't take a dividend in a tough year. They keep the investment going. We've got some fantastic talent in the country. And a recession, if real growth drops 1.5%, you're running a good business, your sales might go flat yeah. for 16 months. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So <clears throat> it clears the cupboard out. It, re it lasts at best 18 months. And then you're back with a cleaner cupboard and you should grow a bit more. But we won't grow by more. We don't have the people and we haven't done the productivity enhancing investment. Brexit is still haunting us. On that note, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for coming in today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.